For the past 158 years, the New York Times Company has sought to gather and distribute reliable news to the people of New York City, the nation, and more recently to a global audience via the largest newspaper-owned website in the world. During that century and a half, six men, six men have led the company through so, some of the most calamitous and perilous times in American history. But I would submit to you tonight that none of his predecessors has faced a challenge on the order of magnitude of the challenge that Arthur Selzberger Jr. now faces. And if you don't think that's a tall order, I want to tell you a little story from the Civil War. Civil War. As the human toll mounted after Gettysburg, there was tremendous outrage over the fact that wealthy individuals could buy their way out of the draft for $300. Anti-draft riots broke out in many northern cities. The worst of these were in New York City. The growing mobs were particularly angry at those newspapers which had aligned themselves with President Lincoln and his anti-slavery policies. At the top of the list, their anger was directed at the 12-year-old New York Times and its founder and first publisher, Henry Raymond, powerful voice for the then new Republican Party. Knowing his newspaper was targeted, Raymond borrowed from the US Army two Gatling guns, an early version of the machine gun. He placed the guns in the second floor windows of the Times building near City Hall. As the mobs neared, they spotted the guns and turned away. My favorite part of the story is, instead, they attacked the New York Tribune, <laughs> which is true. So not only did the New York Times protect itself, it found a way to eliminate the competition at the same time, which was brilliant. Today, the question is whether the New York Times company will be able to dodge another bullet. Only this one will not be coming from an angry mob, but from the barrel of a gun triggered by the most sweeping communications revolution in 500 years. It's a revolution that brings great promise and opportunity, but great peril. The, you know some of this already. The basic business model that has served news media organizations for more than a century is under serious assault. If you read the New York Times this morning, you'll read about the prospect of having major cities in America for the first time without any newspapers. Audiences are fragmented, lines are blurring between journalism, entertainment, and unfiltered, unmediated information. In the face of the sheer volume and ubiquitous of digital information, many news consumers are overwhelmed, confused, or even worse, have become increasingly passive. New media competitors are emerging with little tradition or appreciation of the enduring values of public service journalism. Add to that the most severe global downturn in 75 years, and you can get a glimpse of what it must be like to wake up each morning and be Arthur Selzberger Jr. Just this past week, the Times Company announced, for example, that as part of a lease back plan, it was selling the majority of its headquarters, its new headquarters on 8th Avenue to raise needed cash and keep Wall Street wolves at bay. Not that our guest is totally unprepared for this challenge. His great-grandfather rescued the Times from the brink of bankruptcy in 1896. His father stared down the Nixon administration in one of the great constitutional confrontations of our time and won the Pentagon Papers case in the Supreme Court. Our guest loves to relax by rock climbing, is the president of New York City chapter of Outward Bound. <laughs> we have one fan. He loves motorcycles and freely admits that he skipped his graduation from Tufts in 1974, he was a political science major, to go motorcycle with his cousin. It was a glorious day, he remembers. My cousin and fellow graduate and I heard the road calling. Motorcycles, speeches, no-brainer. He went off on his motorcycle. Following college, 
He had a series of editorial and business positions at the New York Times and other news organizations in Raleigh, the Associated Press, an apprenticeship for taking over the company. He now sits astride of one of the most influential newspaper companies in the world, a company that owns the International Herald Tribune, the Boston Globe, 15 regional newspapers, nine TV stations, two radio stations, several dozen websites, including about.com and the New York Times.com, which, as I said before, is the largest newspaper owned website in the world with about a billion page views every month and perhaps as many as 50 million global visitors. Under his watch, the New York Times has won over 30 Pulitzer Prizes. And they've also had, the New York Times company has had four employees killed in Iraq. Here is what he has had to say about protecting journalistic independence and the quality of the paper in the face of extraordinary pressures. This has never been easy and invariably requires the most difficult balancing act as we keep asking ourselves, how does one simultaneously aim for a new future at a time of great uncertainty while maintaining one's institutional identity? How do you ensure that you are ready for a time that may not conform to your contemplated scenarios? And 10 years ago, Defending journalism and journalists, he said this, the insight and analysis offered by the best newspapers, magazines, and websites are still making a major contribution to the deliberations of our democratic society. Checking facts and using reliable sources are not old-fashioned ideas from a bygone era imposed by a, a, imposed by a pre-digital value system. And finally, he said, Journalists continue to be more trustworthy than fortune tellers, sports agents, and garage mechanics. <laughs> to which I would add tonight, stock analysts and mortgage brokers. Le <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Arthur Sulzberger, Jr.